Sweet. Here we go. All right. So, uh, everyone, this is Gavin. He's a friend of mine. And in this video, in this podcast, I want to focus on something a little bit different. Not necessarily bodybuilding related, but kind of bodybuilding related. But it's more of just like why people start. Like, what was their reason of getting into bodybuilding? What, like, things were they facing in life that made them decide to be like, you know what? I'm going to lift some fucking weights. <laughs> so it's all that. And it's just generally just kind of getting to know the person and their personality of who they are rather than like, hey, man, you look like you lift. You're big and jacked. You must just lift weights every day and eat chicken and rice every day because that's And I think you're pretty much, you know, dumb as dirt. Yeah, basically. Nobody cares if people think you're dumb. You're not like intelligent because you lift weights and muscles for some reason seems to be a sign of like dumb people. Because when you have big bulging muscle, you're just considered an idiot. But that's not essentially that's not true. And there's actually more in depth and more character to people who are into working out, who are athletes, who are fitness individuals. And I would like to start this part of the podcast with Gavin. Um, so tell me a little bit about yourself, Gavin. Like go from the beginning or kind of like a rough overview? Let's start at the beginning. Okay. So I was born into your basic average middle-class white American Christian family. My dad used to be a marathon runner and my mom was a librarian. So literally there was, uh, I mean, except for my dad running, like there was not much athletic background going on. Nobody lifted. My brother lifted a little bit in like middle school and high school, but he ended up getting injured. So he stopped. Uh, and then I, I got into competitive eating. Like when I was about 13, 14, I got into competitive eating. I made some good money off that. I never would have thought that. <laughs> I know, right? Like, I, I used to be able, I could eat. But um, then I got into high school, and my first crush tur uh, struck me down like like that. And she was like, oh, you're kind of fat. So I decided I was going to drop some weight. So yeah. between, the begin between, like, sep August, September of 07 and, like, summer of 2000 and – 2008, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it was 2008. Let's see. Uh, no, 2009. 2009, I dropped about, oh gosh, 120-something pounds. So about 100, yeah, 18 months, dropped about 120 pounds. Still said no anyway, so I'm like, fuck. Mm -hmm. At least I like lifting. And then, you know, I decided after high school, I was going to join the Marine Corps. And in boot camp like everybody thinks oh you're gonna get like skinny in boot camp but, like no they feed you well and sometimes you know they just don't like other than like running and like calisthenics and stuff like that we don't really do much we do a lot of walking and marching and stuff like that but like we didn't burn as many calories as i thought and i actually gained like 10 pounds and i got you think, I got I got you think that was due to like the stressful environment that you were in say what do you think that was due to like the stressful environment you were in with consistently oh, no. like, like you only had 10, like five to 10 minutes to eat. And I, it's like, I was, Hey, I'm a competitive eater. It's like, oh, I yeah, got to right. down some food mm -hmm. and you know, they don't necessarily, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't overweight to the point where they were putting me on, uh, what's called, uh, half rats. So half rations, they do that for people that are like either overweight or out of body fat standards. Um, and I wasn't skinny enough to where they would put me on double rats, which is for people that are just bottom of the weight standards. Yeah. And, you know, they didn't really care what I ate. Like, heck, I would have like two things of cereal, yogurt, bagel, freaking eggs, ham, bacon for breakfast. I mean, I, I could throw down. And, you know, I ended up, I started boot camp, I think I was around 175, 180, and I think I left like 185, 188, something like that. And by the end, my, my senior drill instructor was like, whoa, Corey, you're getting, you're getting kind of fat. Because we always had to be on online every morning, so they would do like a, a morning inspection. And he was like, bro, you're getting fat. Hmm. I'm like, oh, shoot. Do you so, think that played like a mental 
that create like a mental block in your head or did you think that was a mental advantage? I mean, it seems like all your life, people have just been saying you're fat. I mean, it didn't really bother me that much. Um, the only time being overweight was something that really bothered me was uh, three years later, I was up for promotion and I got denied promotion because I was overweight. And the main reason for that is uh, September of 2013, um, I was hospitalized for four days and I flatlined for five minutes because uh, I had what's called sepsis, which is a blood infection. Mm -hmm. And it caused my blood pressure to drop really, really low. I think they got, it got as low as like, maybe like 25 or 30 over like five to 10. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I had pretty much no, no pulse. Um, and they just kept on trying to get uh, as much vasopressin as possible to raise my blood pressure. And I was out for like five, five minutes. I had no heartbeat. And afterwards, like I was extremely lethargic. Um, going upstairs was a challenge. Like imagine what, you, what people think of these bodybuilders are that are on like a gram of trend. They can barely get, they can barely get up a flight of stairs without being out of breath. That was me. So instead of going to the, the dining hall, which was, you know, half a mile, a quarter mile from my barracks, I decide, hey, I'm just going to order Domino's two to three times a day, every single day. I probably spent like $2,000 on Domino's in two months. Mm -hmm. And I went from like, I went from like 225 to like 260. And so would you think that was due to just like, would I was you just lethargic. I just like, I don't even give a fuck right now. Oh, okay. Because I'm, I'm, like I'm getting out in less than a, I was like, I'm getting out in less than a year. What are they going to do? I just didn't care. And then I was like, oh, I want more money right now. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be big. They, they treated me like, like crap sometimes because I was fat. I mean, I, I'll admit I was fat. I mean, I had to get a new, uh, a new dress blues for the, for the Marine Corps ball that year. And I had like a 44, 46 inch waist. Uh, but, you know, at, between like Thanksgiving and like New Year's, I, and probably I think maybe the end of January, early February, I dropped about 30 pounds. I mean, I pretty much just starved myself. It was pretty bad. Like it's, it's ne definitely something I would never recommend to anybody. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing really. I, I kind of knew what I was doing, but not really. Um, so after that, uh, I mean, probably by October of 24, uh, 2014, when I got after about a month after I got out, I got down to like 180, 180 185. And around that time, I decided to, it's like, hey, I was like, hey, I'm looking pretty good. Maybe I want to do a show. So I reached out to actually Lane Norton, and uh, he, he, he was full. And then I read on the forums that he was, like, really expensive. Like, bro, you can't afford him. I mean, and so he uh, pointed me to uh, Dr. Joe, Dr. Joe Klimzewski, who was his coach. And I hired him, and he coached me through my first bodybuilding season, uh, in 2015 and I did uh, one men's physique show and two bodybuilding shows in a natural federation and I just and I figured a lot of the people that were like this is going to get a little controversial but I feel like some of the people near the top are not as truthful as you think probably not is this a like, natural like they, say, they, say they're, they say they're natural but they're not uh. Some of them, I feel like you can tell, but they, but their fans just want to don't want to admit it. But anyway, I think, I think the interesting thing about just the overall bodybuilding community that I've noticed, and which is why majority of the time I try to separate myself from bodybuilders in particular and not get too wrapped up in it, because when I look at them and I see the things that they do, and I hear the things that they do. Um, they all have this mentality where it's like, you're all in or you're not in. So you put everything in or you put nothing at all. Mm -hmm. and for most people, whether that be in a natural organization, um, they tend to go all in with drugs and stuff like that. Or with just like eating or training. And they tend to forget certain things where like they tend to think about their families, um, yeah. their kids, their lifestyle, the things that they do because they're so focused on the competitive aspect of it and this training. But they forget that like bodybuilding itself is an extension of basically supplementing your life to make it better or adds towards your life or what you're already doing, just like yep. everything else. But people tend to like 
just go all in. It's like it's bodybuilding. You go all in, and then like they like burn out at the end. Did you ever find yourself in that situation where you felt like you had to give everything in? Or uh, yeah, uh, it, was, it was during my first season, and you know I got like extremely OCD about everything. Mm. Like I would, I would even, I would even weigh out my salt. Like I, I got, I, I had a spreadsheet and I would calculate my macros to the nearest like 0.1 gram. Like it got bad. I had a terrible relationship with food. All I wanted to do is eat, go to the gym and go to work and everything else I didn't really care about. Mm. And when I was done, and then that's why like, I feel like I had such a bad post-show period because like I almost got sent to the hospital because I gained 20 pounds in 30 hours. I had about 28,000 calories between Saturday night and, sa and uh, Monday morning. So um, you're a dietitian as well, right? Or you're yeah. going to be. I'm about to be. I'm, I'm retaking my test next month. Okay. Um, and also being a bodybuilder and being part of this whole bodybuilding community, do you see a lot of people having eating disorder? Oh, Absolutely. Uh, especially, uh, it's, it's more common in women than it is in men, but I mean, you, you could tell anybody, uh, I could tell they have a bad relationship with food because of what they look forward to the most post-show. You always see these people, you know, they are either afraid to eat post-show or they have like a hundred, two hundred dollars worth of junk food they stockpiled throughout prep, and then they just get fat afterwards. People that actually do that. that. I was there. Yeah, I was there. I've seen, and I've seen it so much worse. Um, like I've seen, you know, men, women that they those stockpile pop tarts, bagels, candy, brownie, cookies, especially all these like designer brownie and cookie companies out there. They just stock up. They have a freezer full of ice cream and stuff like that that they just stockpile during prep. I'm like you're 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 gonna make things a lot worse by doing that and um i've worked with a few people and i help them get through disordered eating tendencies i don't say you know an eating disorder because technically that's out of my scope of practice because i'm not a psychiatrist so yeah. i i kind of have to change the terminology a little bit and you know i do a lot of times they are either referred to they're either talking to a therapist already or i say hey maybe it'd be a good idea for you to reach out to a therapist mm -hmm. and one of the good thing is now i actually have a therapist with my uh with my company right now so you know new clients can get uh psychological counseling through that mm -hmm. That's really important either going into a prep if I got a new client and they've never prepped with me before or coming out of a, sh uh, a prep uh, so we can gauge where they're out mentally. So you yourself, did you encounter any psychological um, issues yep. while through your whole bodybuilding career? Yeah, I, I did. Like, I mean, even, okay, let's start back in like high school. Like I, I, I was extremely restricted. Some days I would not even eat lunch. I mean, cause I was like, Oh, I'll just eat less calories doing that. And then I ended up binging at dinner. And I why still, did you do that? Uh, because I, I was very self-conscious about how I looked. Like was I was stem in from the fact that people always say, Hey, you're overweight. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a lot of it. It's like I felt very self conscious. Um, you know, I, I had a very small class in high school, so I was always around that girl I liked. So I was like, oh gosh, I gotta lose more weight. I gotta lose more weight. That's all I cared about. And then during no, no go on, go on. All right. And then when I was competing, then I got like extremely OCD. So I went to the opposite end of the spectrum. Like I was like, obsessed about what I ate and how much I ate. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like, then afterwards, like, I had trouble with uh, cycle binging for probably about six to eight months. Like, I decided, uh, so I, I got up to around, I, went, I was 165 on stage. I was 185 by Monday morning. And by the end of that week, I was 170. And I just couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I just had to go back up from there. By Christmas, I was about 195. So about three months later, I was, about, when I was up 25 pounds. And uh, later that year, I decided to do the same show that I did for my first show. And that was when they introduced Classic. And I was like, hey, I, I could probably do good in this. And so I decided, oh, I'm going to use this as an excuse to get, get rid of all this fat that I put on because I was an idiot post-show. And it just triggered another binge cycle. So I decided, it's like, hey, 
best not to do that for a while. Mm-hmm. And I just got out of that. And then by the end of that year, beginning of uh, 2017, I started, I started college. So I didn't really care about doing a show. I didn't do my next show after 2015 until last year when I did one in uh, August. Did you think when you started um, college, did your perspective of what it is to be competitive or a bodybuilder, just anything in fitness uh, in general, changed? Um, I was actually a lot more focused when I was in college because I was super regimented. Like every day was the same. You know, I would wake up. I would go on a little walk. I would go to. I would eat breakfast. I would go to school. Um, I would have my pre. I would have my lunch at school. I would go to the gym an hour later. I would come home and then just do the rest of my day. And like, I just got super regimented during college. And I think it possibly also helped by the fact that you know, right at uh, twenty. Let's see, November twenty sixteen. I did a photo shoot. Like a week later, I started taking gear. Um. And I think that kind of kept me a little bit more focused because I was like, oh, I got I to make the most of this. I can't waste this. Because mm-hmm. when I started college, I was still during my first cycle. That is usually one of the things that tends to happen. Um, people starting taking gear at an age, especially roughly around college. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was 25. So I've been training for almost 10 years. By then, it was about nine years. And, you know, I feel like hormonally, I was in a good spot to where it wasn't going to really kill me. Mm, understood. So um, let's take the whole bodybuilding aspect out of that. Um, what are the things do you like to do? Uh, I like to read. I mean, I am, I'm really big on education. Um, because I'm a, I'm an educator for my clients as well. So I'm, I'm always like doing research. I'm on PubMed and CBI and all that stuff. Uh, I like, I used to be a a competitive three gun shooter, um, before I had my little, uh, hospitalization. And after that, like, I think there may have been like something that happened in my nervous function and I have very shaky hands now. I, I don't have steady hands anymore, so I can't do that anymore, but I still like going to the gun range. You'd be the um, worst person to ask to take a video at the gym. Say what? <laughs> so you'd be the worst person to ask to take a video at the gym. Oh, I have to, I have to like crouch down, have one knee up, and like stabilize it on my knee. Otherwise, it's yeah. like, I can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's great. I love, and if, for people that follow me on Instagram, like I love cooking. I love grilling, especially. Like uh, I, somebody told me I should probably start like a second, like either like a YouTube or like a second Instagram for, uh, butchery. So for like yeah, butchery, a really, a really good idea. And what I've noticed about Instagram is that like, it's mainly just for pictures and stuff like that. Yeah. But if you do have like a cooking channel on, let's say YouTube, you could actually post pictures on your Instagram and then funnel that towards yep. your, uh, YouTube and then that build up your, um, your viewers and your subscribers. But like, like you said, like you, Instagram is mainly just like photo based. Like I have a YouTube channel where I try to, in a way, promote it to give a lot more information towards my client. But I have noticed that like, when I say, Hey, subscribe and follow, everyone's just like, okay, we're too lazy. (laughs) So they don't do it. So you have to really, if you're going to do that, I think it's a great idea for you, especially if you love to cook. Oh yeah. Like the idea of cooking, which is nice. I mean, also a lot of girls think that's a bonus too. If you love to cook. I mean, you think so, but it's like it's the even with me being able to cook, it's still the hardest thing to freaking get a girlfriend these days. Like the real, the whole dating scene is just fucked up. I I completely agree. It's a little, uh, what is it? It's like uh, quick satisfaction kind of thing. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. So that's one of the things. So um, so you like to cook. You like to read. I'm guessing when you read, it's more about like science-based, which is why you're more of an evidence-based um, coach, because that is what is one of your passions. So cooking, mm-hmm. reading, anything else? Um, shooting, definitely shooting. Um, Sounds like a real American thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, hey, I live in Alabama. I mean, it's like it's either Jesus, football, fried chicken, or guns. Uh, sounds like the place I would not want to be, especially for a black guy. I mean, you could go to Birmingham. There's actually a pretty big black population down there. Really? 
yeah. Do you think that's mainly from like historical times? Because I'm sure Alabama. Oh, yeah. Well, it's like Birmingham, Montgomery, and Mobile down by the coast. Uh, is where you, there's like more concentrations of that. Uh, up where I live, up in Huntsville, because we get people from all over the country because it's a big hub for like the engineering industry. Yeah. So you get people from everywhere, like you know, Hispanics, you know, Middle Eastern, Asian, Hispanic. Or oh, did I already say Hispanic? I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's probably, Spanish, but same thing. Yeah. So how long have you been living there? Uh, we moved here in 1999, so like 21 years. Uh, what was the reason for the move? Uh, my dad, uh, was in, he was in, uh, communications, like communications, education. Uh, he made like a lot of, uh, like slideshows and stuff like that for engineering firms, things like that. Um, his, he got his master's in educate in uh, communication education. Um, adult education and so they hired him for that um, he had various jobs here uh, his last job he had was working on the military base for one of the engineering firms uh, helping with uh, educational uh, material for uh, I, I actually don't even remember what, what, uh, what it was exactly but that's, that's what he was in charge of um, and then my mom never had a job uh, since I've been since I was born because she stopped being a librarian right before I was born, and she was just a house mom for the rest of the time. Ah, so um, that's actually a pretty interesting topic when you take today's um, progressive movement towards like women being stay at home, and then dads working or vice versa, or women working more, and then um, yeah, I mean a lot of times you see things you know with uh, w wanting. I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't like getting into touchy subjects that much, but it's like, you know, with the whole thing about equal rights, you know, you have a lot of more women, they want to be, uh, they want to excel in the workforce. I have no problems with that. Um, personally, uh, if I had a family, I, th I think it's a good idea for at least one of the parents to be there, to be more present for raising the child rather than just keeping them in daycare most of the time. And they're not, you know, you're only there in the, e the mornings and the evenings. I think like parental presence is a very important aspect of, uh, you know, some, uh, a child's upbringing. You're speaking like that had a huge impact on you growing up. It did, it did actually. Way. Yeah. Uh, like I saw like my mom and my dad had a very good relationship. I was around my mom most of the time. Like she drove me actually my near the end. My dad drove me to school uh, every morning before he went to work. He picked me up from uh, the gym out after uh, after school. Um, but I mean, I had a very good relationship with my parents. Um, my mom uh, was I mean, she was always someone I could talk to. She was always there if I if I ever got sick or anything. And my dad is probably like my biggest role model and, and things. Um, and like people that see my uh, my Instagram, like I post my, about my dad a lot because uh, if we're talking about the the one person that like helped me be who I am now, it's definitely my dad because he was big on like uh, hard work. Like he wouldn't let me have anything unless I worked for it. Like I had my first job when I was like 15, um, worked at a pizza place. He was really big on like respecting respecting adults. Um, respecting other people, uh, respect for women, which I don't know why that is such a hard thing. But yeah, and you seem to embody that, especially. I mean, considering the majority of my clients are women, and all my clients love me, like I guess I guess that definitely uh, I definitely embody that a lot. I think that does play a role into like your mother always being there, being able to like uh, raise um, raise you as you were um, younger. And yep. you kind of got some of her personality kind of like mixed in with yours as well. Yeah, uh, I feel like I got a good mix of both my parents. Uh, I definitely have a much more patient demeanor because my mom. Mm -hmm. I have uh, a more confident demeanor because my dad. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't always have that. I actually did not have that as much until I went to college. Uh, like even during the Marine Corps, I was a very timid person. I was not... Like I'm a, I'm an outspoken person, but I'm still, I was still kind of shy and you know, not so much anymore. Um, but like, I'm, I've, I've never really been like a, I've never been an asshole, I guess you could say. Like it's, it's, it's actually like in the Marine Corps, they, um, 
they got mad at me because I was not big on uh, disciplining people underneath me once I got promoted. And like, it's, it's like, it's like, dude, just be an asshole. I'm like, I don't know how. Yeah. Yeah, like, me you piss me off. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can turn on you pretty quick, um, but like staying that way, it's like no. Like typically, if I'm if I if I if, if I'm an asshole to somebody, yeah, eventually, yeah, I'm all apologize. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. Um, so you being into lifting, did you think it actually helped you a lot more to be able to control some of that? Because I know there's probably some times when you kind of just want to like blow a fuse but being more in tune with working out and being able to um, control certain tempers here and there, do you think that helped towards? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like there are some days where I'm just like, I'm just pissed off at the world. Like, you know, during my internship last year, uh, I was just have some days where it's like, can this day just freaking be over? Like I was just pissed off at everybody and, you know, going to the gym, I'm like, okay, I feel so much better after that. Now Um, high school, I got bullied a lot, so my gym was like an outlet for that. Mm. Like they bullied me because I was fat, and then they bullied me because they thought I was socially awkward, which I'll admit I kind of was. Nah, that's um, that happens almost. I mean, hey, when you're in high school, like everybody's a little socially awkward. Everybody's a little messed up. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like when I was deployed in 2012, I had some bad days and I was just, I would just go to the gym, just freaking destroy myself. And I would just be like, oh, I can finally go to bed now. Yeah. Um, taking that into, into consideration, let's see for people who don't work out, people who don't lift, people who don't have this source of like, the source to channel whatever issues are going through in life. How would you think a regular person who does not do any of this, I'm not saying they're regular, but just like someone who doesn't work out. Yeah. How would you think they would cope with such, let's say from when they were younger and they were being bullied all the time. They were um, depressed, social anxiety and all that stuff. And when they got older, when they were younger, they didn't work out or anything at all. How did you think they handled that? Did you think they kind of focused more on like doing drugs? Like, I mean, I've seen a lot of people who turn to drugs. They'll turn to alcohol. Um, they'll you see like sometimes you see a personality change. You know, they may have been a nicer person when they were younger. They turn into like a more aggressive person when they're older because of things that they went through when they were younger. Um, they may have like a short fuse. Some people have anger issues. Uh, yeah, I, I can definitely see that because they don't have that like something like, to balance them out. Yeah, that way to like channel whatever issue they're going on with without having to hurt anyone or themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but going to the gym, I've always realized that like, it's you're kind of breaking yourself down <laughs> and then kind of building yourself back up again. And when you do that over a consistent amount of time, you kind of get to the point where like, you know what's what, you know a little bit more about yourself because you've been able to break yourself down to like, I wouldn't say molecular level, but more to like, I guess, I don't know what's the right word. From an intellectual perspective, you get to know yourself, who you are a lot better, I feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it also helps with being able to like stay more focused towards a specific goal. I think, again, one of the reasons why I'm doing this is because I think the general population would look at someone who's very into lifting, who's very deep into like working out, and they would see that person and look at them and say, you're just tunnel vision, and the only thing you think about is just working out <laughs> but it just goes so much it's just so much deeper than that and we rarely ever have time to like explain to people because within that first five seconds of them seeing us what they automatically do is just assume what we are based on our physical appearance appearances so my question is what have you encountered like let's say since you started lifting how has um how have people treated you? Have they treated you good, bad, in between, a little bit of both? This can also a little bit of both. Like I've had some people that they 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 think I'm in the gym and they think they, that's my life. There's some people that think you know, oh, he's not very smart. And then I've had people that think, oh, he's probably really aggressive. Yeah. Like don't. Be, I've had some people like, oh, don't beat me up. Mm -hmm. And then there's the people that really get to know me and 
understand that, you know, since like 2007, I've been learning about the science of all this. They're like, oh, he's actually very smart. Mm-hmm. Like I've had people that look at me, either the, they either think I'm dumb or that I'm smart. Mm-hmm. And typically people that, that just meet me for the first time, uh, like some of them were like, wow, you're actually very articulate for a guy in the gym. I'm like, thanks. So you're like, is that an insult or a compliment? I know, it's like you're, you're, you're saying I'm very well spoken, but you basically assume I'm an idiot. <laughs> yes, yes, that's so. That is so true. Um, so many times I've had that happen. Like when I was in, like my very first class I took in college uh, when I moved down to Florida was a public speaking class, and you know we had to give an introduction, and I was like, yeah. I like lifting. I'm a, I'm a bodybuilder. And they didn't think it's like, Oh gosh, here we go. And then I get, it's like, Oh, this fucking my final, my final speech I had to give was a eulogy and I made my teacher cry. Mm. And I was like, yeah, how dumb am I now? That's so funny. And again, that's exactly why I want to do this. Cause I want people to be able to like give a different perspective from what the rest of the world see them as, because we're not all just, meatheads we're not all just like idiots nope I'm not even that big so uh, you can't be like oh yeah that's all he cares about it's like I ain't even that big well to the general population to the general population I've had like I've, I've tried asking out you know like a normal female gym goer and she's like oh god ew, you're too big I'm like I ain't that big yeah right I, you think I look like Jay it's not like I'm Jay Cutler or something um, do you think, let's say, uh, working out, do you think that has affected your uh, relationship with women, especially being able to ask them out? Like, do you think, like, when you go up to a girl and you're like, hey, whatever, whatever, whatever you say is usual, then do you think they're like, oh, wow, this guy's big and gross, like, ill, I don't want to, like... But it made me a lot more discerning, to be honest. Like I would, like when I was in the Marine Corps, I would just, go, I would just talk to any chick that freaking did, that was above a six. Were you overweight? Uh, I was, I was overweight a little bit in the Marine Corps. Uh, like I, I probably hovered between like two hundred and two twenty most of the time, but it wasn't like the best two twenty. Mm. Um, but like I had some, like probably about two thousand fourteen was I, I, like I tried doing the whole online dating thing, mm. and. I met a few people and, you know, I just realized like, oh gosh, I have terrible taste in women. And then over time, you know, it's like, I, I, I kind of knew what I wanted a lot more. So I, I asked out a lot less people. Um, the, my problem was, you know, I tried doing more things online because everywhere I lived, there was never a good selection. Like there was never a really good female lifting population. So that was always my problem. It's like, oh gosh, oh you like me, but you're across the country. I was like, well, this ain't gonna work out. Yeah. Um, in terms of like, so personally, I always try my best to not date girls who work out. It's weird, but I know what it's like and the time and effort that's put into working out. Sometimes I guess it's good to have somebody that does that, that's into the exact same thing that you do. But it's gonna be somebody to keep you accountable, but I feel like you could have someone that keep you, keeps you accountable as long as they, right there's someone that understands the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, mo- I've, the the thing I've come across is most people, most women that I've come across that are not into lifting. Mm-hmm. They think that the whole lifting bodybuilding lifestyle is very foreign and very weird. They're like, "Oh, hey, you want to go out and have drinks tonight?" I'm like, "No, I can't do that." And then they, they think it's, they think they take it as an insult to them. Like, you never have time for me. It's like, I make plenty of time for you. I just don't want to freaking, I just don't want to eat out and go get drinks and stuff like that because, you know, I have something coming up or something. Yeah. Like if I'm prepping, I mean, I, I can compromise for like a drink, but I'm not going to do it every day. Exactly. I can compromise for eating. But then again, I, I tell, I realize I can get away with this shit. I'm like most people. So <laughs> I have to be on my game. Like at the beginning of a diet, I could do pretty well, but by the end, like I'm 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 on, on a bik- I'm a high, I'm on a high protein bikini girl diet. Mm. I'm not as bad as Austin Stout. Like yeah. I remember when he was prepping, he got down to like fourteen hundred, thirteen hundred calories, and I was like, oh gosh, bro, I feel yeah. so bad for you. Yeah, it sucks. Um, I got down to like 16, 1700, but I was pretty much just eating 350 grams of protein and nothing else. Mm. A bunch of veggies. So, I mean, you don't have to answer this, but it's all up to you. 
Um, how's the date in life? Eh, I kind of take a, I, I, eh, it's kind of taking a back, back seat right now. The, mo the main thing I'm focused on is passing my RD exam, building up, rebranding my business, and getting a, I want to get a full-time RD position in town because I want to have multiple streams of income. I, I want to get into like, uh, start consulting um, for either other coaches or other companies or things like that. Just have multiple avenues of income. And then when I'm more stable and I have more time for that kind of stuff, yeah, I'll think about it. I think that's actually a really good approach. I mean, yeah, there, there are women I'm talking to, but at the same time, it's like I have right now priorities and then I have future priorities and that's more of a future priority. Yeah, I completely agree. That's um, actually the stance I've taken on like, relationship as a whole I mean me for myself again when you said you have pretty bad taste in women I kind of chuckled a little because I tend to find myself in that exact same situation but I, I kind of recognize that as an issue and uh, I've kind of just stepped back and just focus on my goals and kind of try to like focus on what I need to do to get to where I need to be. And that's what everybody kept telling me to do. And I was so stubborn. I'm like, no, I'm going to do what I want. And it never yeah. worked. Yeah. Like, um, the one thing is just focus on you, do what you have to do. Um, because at the end of the day, if you're not focused on you, you're not really financially stable. So if you focus on your goals and try to get to where you need to be, you're financially stable. Now, on top of that, you also have great confidence to be like, I've done all the stuff I wanted to do. Nothing can stop you. And at that point, you can like basically go for whoever you want because you have the wealth, you have the money, you have the intelligence. There's nothing that can hold you back from like what you want. And if okay, it's, like, it's another thing. It's like, well, what if I find someone on the, on the other side of the country that I like and I could see a lot of potential with? Well, it's like, well, if I'm not financially stable, it's like, I can't really travel. Like, that's how that's been the case a lot of times. Like, well, I wanted to meet this person, but I never got the opportunity because I never had the money available to go travel. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's the same situation for them. Either they're very busy or their financial situation may not be the best. And neither of us can travel to each other. And it's like, well, I don't know how this is going to work. Yeah, right. And that's the hardest part about it. Um, so you, I just want to get more into your hobbies and things that you love to do. Shooting, reading, and the other one was... Shooting, reading, cooking. Okay. Um, I mean, cooking would probably be my biggest hobby, I would say, because I love looking at, like, there's a few food cha uh, channels I follow on YouTube um, one I really like is called Guga Foods. It's uh, about a guy. It's a guy in, my, in Miami, and he's who I learned a lot about, like cooking steaks and stuff like that. Because that's what a lot of like on my story, if I post food. It's like, look at my perfect medium rare steak. It's perfect, 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Do you think, aside from just trying to get into fitness overall, actually, better question: What got you into trying to go for your degree as a RD? Uh, the main thing was I got into the coaching business in 2016 and then I found out like, like I'm, I'm all about trying to do things within the law. Um, and in a lot of States, especially like Alabama. And then I moved down to Florida. Um, it, it's illegal to give nutritional counseling, um, unless you are a licensed and registered dietitian. So like other States, like, you know, it's, out west or like Carolinas, you don't you don't have to be a registered dietitian, but you know I like the I like the cost of living and the financial climate here, so I'm probably gonna stay here for a while. Um, but yeah, so like it's it's technically I can't give like in person nutritional counseling to anybody unless I'm a registered dietitian. I thought the thing with that was like you can't give like um, any of those things, but you can kind of like point them in the right direction. You could get, yeah, you can, you can reword things um, and be like, oh, this is recommendation. You can't give nutritional prescription. Yeah, like to cure, like, a, well, a cure obesity. You can't do that. Or like a disease or anything like that. Yeah, and I've seen some people, they try to, uh, they try to take the medical route and try to say, oh, I cured this person's uh, disease or whatever. I'm like, 
First of all, that's outside of your scope of practice. Second of all, 99% of the time, you're trying to sell some sort of health supplement or you own a supplement company or something like that. And it's like, they probably weren't as, as bad off as you make them sound to be. Yeah, like, like fixing hormones. <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, you could be started. You probably saw that post that I made on my, uh, on my Facebook and Instagram. I did not, but I'm going to have to look at it. Yeah. Basically, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not calling anybody out, but like I've seen it all over the country. You see like these wellness clinics and they're, they're run by non MDs. Like I've seen some of them. They're run by like more like uh, endocrinologists at that point. No, no, no. It's not like an endocrinologist is an MD. Oh, okay, gotcha. That's just a subset of it. But, you know, you see people that are like chiropractors, nutritionists, some people like this, and they're giving hormonal prescription and stuff like that. But I'm like, you're not a freaking doctor. Right. And then it's like, you, it's like you're just putting people on hormones. You don't even know what they're some, – some of the times you don't even know what their freaking levels are. Or they, 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 adjust, uh, they adjust things based on, oh, well, this is how they feel. It's like how about you look at their freaking lab work first? Mm. Yeah, and that seems to be one of the things that's very, like, a lot of people don't tend to do. Like, the, That's something I push, like, 90% of the time, unless I know that you actually do take care of yourself and you have no issues going on at the time, mm-hmm. except for that, that 10%. 90% of the time, if you're going to prep with me, get your freaking blood work done. If you're an enhanced competitor, get your freaking blood work done. I don't, you can't work with me. I don't even want to talk to you until you get your blood work done. In fact, there was one woman um, that I work with. I love working with her. I turned her away initially because I wanted her to get blood work done because she had a lot of health complications. Mm. And since we've been working together, we've gotten through a lot of that stuff. And like she's made fantastic progress. And I like coach client relationship, like that's solid as hell. Yeah. But like, I'm super big on that because I'm like, if you don't know what's going on internally and you're going to go take stuff, how are you going to know what to, uh, what to, account for when it comes to uh you know side effects from ear use like you if like some people could be predisposed to uh hypercholesterolemia which is you know high cholesterol so it's like okay um if you take gear especially orals that's going to jack up your your uh your lipids so you should probably you know either talk to your doctor about getting a a statin which that's actually the last resort i do not recommend that right away um or you know things like citrus bergamot which helps with uh cholesterol that's very very good for that i'm a big fan of that or like if you're someone like me uh who is prone to high blood pressure either from stress or just genetic predisposition it's like i have to take take that into account whenever i do a cycle i always look at my my kidney function and then I do health supplementation accordingly. Mm. Yeah, because those are very important and very vital. I actually do that exact same thing with my clients. Like, I don't have a lot of enhanced clients, but if they're willing to go to that route, I just tell them, hey, man, get your blood work. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, a lot of them like, oh, I don't have the time or I don't have the money. I'm like, uh, invest one hundred thirty dollars. Get your blood work done, so you don't invest like you don't have to spend five thousand dollars fixing it later on. Yeah, exactly. And it's good to have coaches who preach that. It's very rare to find coaches who preach that because everyone's just like trying to make out a quick buck. Oh gosh, no. I hate like I hate it. Like there's so many coaches out there. They're not nutritionists. They're freaking chemists. Oh yeah, tell me about it. And, you know, I feel like a lot of them, they don't take into the psychological thing, the, the psychological aspect. They're just like, oh, you're just weak. I'm like, you, you got to do what I tell you to do. Uh, and then some of them, I've seen some coaches, you know, if a client even asks a question, they think they're questioning the coach and the coach shames them. Mm. I've had a few people come to me from other coaches that did that. Mm. Like one of my best clients, uh, heck, uh, her, she was – going hypo and passing out on her drive to work and because she was like on no food and her coach was like oh that's normal just push through it i'm like hell no that ain't normal yeah it's a little crazy especially for a freaking bikini girl i'm tired of seeing bikini girls freaking starve going into shows like yeah sure you have less muscle mass but like you shouldn't be doing freaking 800 calories in a day and doing like two hours of cardio how about you just 
tell, uh, I think more coaches should just tell clients, it's like, don't get fat in the off season or prep longer. Yes. That's what I've been doing. So, um, okay. This is a pretty good start. Um, I like the more in depth responses to based on your life, your experience, relationships, um, data, and overall, like who you are as a person rather than just someone saying, Hey, you're Gavin, the bodybuilder. <laughs> yeah. No, no. That's definitely not what I want people to look at you as there's just so much more in depth in you as a person than just some guy who works out. And that is essentially what I like to do with these podcasts is get, I don't care if they're freaking professional, if they're amateurs, if they, whatever they are, as long as I can get them on to tell their story, just like you did, I'll be more than happy with that because in a way I feel like having more people come on and tell more than just, Hey man, I lift weights. <laughs> would be pretty interesting to like learn more about what else they do besides just working out. So I do appreciate you taking the time to get this going. And again, I will be posting this and it's, I would love to see what the response is on here. And also if you're somebody who watches towards the very end, even if you don't, I'm going to put like in the beginning of the video and say, Hey, if you have time and you want to talk a little bit about yourself, then a lot of people don't really take the time to kind of like know about you. You're more than welcome to. It doesn't matter if you are a IFBB pro, if you're just an average gym goer. Age doesn't matter. Well, it might. <laughs> but your age doesn't matter. Just come on in and we'll just talk. And we'll have the, I don't have a lot of subscribers, but whatever amount I have, I would love for them to just see a whole different perspective of people who are generally into fitness, athletes, or just overall bodybuilding. I would love to get Terrence Ruffin on here. Oh, absolutely. I love that guy. Saying, if you ever watch this, or at least like watch at the very end, Terrence, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. <laughs> but I'm going to definitely make that happen. <laughs> so, um, Thanks, Gavin. Not a problem, man. I'm going to start working on this after I eat. Now it's a matter of finding where the stop button is.